Welcome to another deep dive into one of my favorite design patterns. This time we're investigating the decorator pattern, which is an extraordinarily elegant way to extend or modify already existing behavior without changing the existing code. And as you are used to on my channel, we will go far beyond learning how to implement a decorator pattern. Let us talk about what the principles behind the pattern are, when to use it, how it connects to the solid principles, how it improves testability, whether to use dynamic or static dispatch, and how it compares to the visitor pattern. As always, I will take you through an example that outlines a prime scenario in which decorators are a great design choice. My name is Max, this is Green Tea Coding, and now let's hop into our decorator example. With today's example, I would like to take you into the world of game development once more, because I guess most of you will be able to relate here. We've got two units, a player and an enemy, and we want them to engage in a fight till death. Let us take a quick look at the implementation before we start the battle. The unit itself has a name, a health and an attack ability stored as a trait object. The underlying trait is the attack trait, which only defines one method, attack. If you are wondering why the attack trait is defined in unit.rs rather than in the attack.rs file, I'll just let you know that this is an intentional design choice to reduce coupling. If you are curious about this, I suggest you watch my video on dependency inversion. In addition to the attack trait, we also have the targetable trait that defines the method which a targetable object needs to implement. The implementations for the unit are quite straightforward. We provide a new method as a very thin wrapper around the object initialization, and the attack target method simply uses the stored attack ability on the target. Taking damage works as expected with a small log output. Health and name are just getters. Moving to attack.rs, as far as the attacks are concerned, we only have a plain physical attack that does nothing more than deal damage to the target. Well, pretty boring, huh? So in order to take things up a notch, let's add some functionality to our attack. The physical attack shouldn't only deal damage, but should be able to strike multiple times and execute the enemy in a single hit if their health is below a certain threshold. So let us now look at this new and improved version of the physical attack. It stores members for indicating the damage per strike, the number of strikes, as well as the health threshold below which the enemy will be executed. The implementation of the attack trait works as follows. Everything is inside a loop that runs for num strikes iteration. Inside the loop, we first check whether the target is below the execution threshold. If that is the case, we attack for its remaining health, otherwise we attack for the damage stored in our member damage. Let's take a quick look at how I set up the main function. The player has an attack that deals 15 damage, strikes only once, so no multi-strike here, but can execute below 30 HP. On the other hand, the enemy has an attack that deals 10 damage with a multi-strike count of 3, but no execute. If we now run this code, the following thing happens. First, the player hits the enemy for 15 damage, then the enemy hits the player for 30 damage combined, and we are at 70 or 55 health respectively. And this continues until the enemy falls below 30 health, at which point it is executed, takes 25 damage, and the player barely survives with 10 health. So we could see that everything works well, so what is the problem with this code? Well, the problem I have with this code is this physical attack function. Although the method is still rather compact, we can already see that adding more functionality to it, for example, critical strikes, chance to miss, or percentage damage increase, will lead to an absolute monstrosity. This is the often cited spaghetti code everybody fears. And even without adding more functionality, testing this function already takes a lot of effort as we are running into a problem best described as a combinatorial explosion. Every test needs to include one case with multi-strike, i.e. more than one strikes, and one without, as well as a case with execute and one without it. This is to make sure that all mechanics interact properly and our code doesn't behave weird in any edge case scenario. 
Needless to say, the moment we introduce additional mechanics, for example the critical strikes, we need to adapt and duplicate all existing test cases. So we can see that this approach to layering attack mechanics is not sustainable at all. In terms of the solid principles, it violates the open-closed as well as the single responsibility principle, which is a strong indicator that our so-called quote-unquote design is not very mature yet. What we would like is to separate the individual mechanics, i.e. have a single method for how multi-strike and one for how executions work, rather than lumping it all into one method. And of course, this is where our journey towards the decorator pattern starts. To start off, let's go back to square one. Physical attack really should be a very simple base attack that does nothing more than deal damage to the target. And like this, it represents a single responsibility, and surely we can't go wrong by keeping it that way. And now that we've gotten rid of the mess, it's time to reintroduce the attack modifiers in a more modular way. In order to make solid choices for our refactoring, let us take a step back and see what the constraints and the goals of our redesign are. The unit requires a trait object of the trait attack to attack a target. This trait is strongly coupled to the unit itself, so we shouldn't touch it. And again, if you wonder why this is a good practice, I cannot recommend the dependency inversion video enough. So whatever we decide to do with our rework of the attack, we need to package it into a struct that implements the attack trait, otherwise we're breaking the contract with the unit. On the other front, let's think about what we want from our redesign. We would like to freely combine attack modifiers with base attacks, i.e. multi-strike and execute with a physical attack, or only multi-strike with a magic attack, which is not yet implemented, but could be another base attack to come up. We also want a clear separation of concerns between the attack modifiers, as we already stated earlier. This will lower the complexity of our code and untangle the spaghettis, so to say. And last but not least, we want good testability for our base attacks and modifiers. Only tested code is good code. The base attack, e.g. our physical attack, already contains some logic and implements the attack trait, so it would be wise if we don't throw this one out the window. One way to modify or extend existing functionality without changing the existing code is to create a wrapper around it. This wrapper takes in a base attack at construction and then uses the wrapped attack in a modified or augmented way. For example, the multi-strike wrapper could take in a physical attack as its wrapped attack and then execute it in a loop for a given number of strikes. This would allow us to optionally add a multi-strike wrapper to the physical attack and separate the logic for attacking multiple times from that of the base attack. So we're making huge steps towards the single responsibility and the open-closed principle. And because there might be different base attacks in the future, it is wise to wrap a trait object of the attack trait rather than the physical attack directly. This not only gives us more flexibility for extensions, but also provides abstraction for the wrapped attack, allowing us to mock it in tests. This is a good start, but we have not yet fulfilled our constraint. We need to keep the contract with the unit, stating that the unit needs an object that implements the attack trait. The base attack already implements this trait, but what about our wrappers? Well, uh, coincidentally, or maybe by design, who knows? The functionality our multi-strike wrapper implements is exactly the one described by the attack trait. So it's just a formality to add the trait. And if our wrapper implements the same trait as our base attack, it can be used in its place whenever a trait object is required. So for all intents and purposes, as seen from the unit, a blank physical attack and a multi-strike wrapped physical attack are now equivalent. What we have created here is no longer referred to as a wrapper, but as a decorator. A decorator has two very important features that set it apart from a normal wrapper. It modifies or enhances the functionality of the wrapped object, and it implements the same trait as the wrapped object and can thus be used interchangeably. With this design, we can now decorate not only any base attack, but other attack decorators as well, as they implement the attack trait. So, you could decorate a base physical attack with a multi-strike decorator, and on top, put the execute decorator. As you can see, this design satisfies our goal for freely combining attack modifiers. 
And because each base attack and modifier is defined in its own struct, we have a clear separation of concerns. As the wrapped attack is only referenced via a trait object, it can be stopped for testing, improving our testability by heaps and bounds. Let us now take this concept to our code. We will implement two decorators, one for multi-strike and one for execution. Our multi-strike decorator needs two members, the number of strikes and the wrapped attack. As just outlined, we don't want to specifically wrap a base attack here, but a trait object of the attack trait instead to enable stacking decorators. Again, I'm adding a very slim new method here, but this one is not strictly required. The meat of destruct is the implementation of the attack trait, which uses the wrapped attack in a loop. And you can see that this is very straightforward and thus quick and easy to test. After this, we'll implement the execute decorator in much the same way. The only difference is the implementation of the attack trait, which differentiates between an execute attack and a normal attack using the wrapped attack. Of course, our main function has to change accordingly. We now layer individual attacks. In this case, we'll give the player a base attack with 15 physical damage and wrap that in an execute attack with a health threshold of 30 HP. Then we'll provide the player with this just wrapped attack. On the enemy side, we'll have a base attack with 10 health, but we'll wrap it in a multi-strike decorator that strikes three times. And of course, it would not be a problem at all to layer more decorators, i.e. a multi-strike execute attack for the player. Note, however, that order matters here. If you first decorate with a multi-strike and then with the execute, only the first strike will check for execution range. Done the other way around, every single strike within the multi-strike series will possibly execute. And of course, for good measure, let us run this code and see that everything works. Yes, everything seems fine. The player does attack with a multi-strike and executes the enemy at the end. You might have noticed that I worked with dynamic dispatch here all the way. And if you are not quite sure you understand the difference between static and dynamic dispatch, feel free to refer to my video about polymorphism. Of course, we could have gone with static dispatch here via generics to improve runtime performance, but we would miss out on a few things. Number one, in my opinion, dynamic dispatch syntax is easier to read, but this is only my five cents and personal preference, so it's a decision you have to make on your own. The really big thing here is the flexibility at runtime. With dynamic dispatch, you can freely stack those decorators in any way you choose, which might come in very handy if some of these attack decorators came in through items, for example, a sword that grants the execute below 30 HP and gloves that grant the multi-strike ability. You can never know as a developer how players will combine their gear, so it's not known at compile time what combinations are possible. For static dispatch, however, you need to know these combinations at compile time because of monomorphization. If you are applying decorators in a different field, though, it might make sense to use static dispatch. So, for a good measure, you can find the respective code on my GitHub repository, linked in the video description. Are we done yet? No, we are not done yet. We covered how to implement decorators. But more important is the when and why. You know that in my videos I want you to take away as much as possible. And I value your time, so let's make the next few minutes worth your time. And if you think your time here was well spent, consider subscribing to the channel and leaving a like. In a recent video I covered the visitor pattern, which on the first glance might fill a very similar need as the decorators. So let's quickly go over what the difference between those two is and when to use which. As we just saw, the decorator pattern extends or alters already existing functionality. The visitor pattern, on the other hand, adds functionality to a struct that didn't previously exist. Therefore, decorators enable the single responsibility as well as the open-closed principle for functionality, while the visitor pattern primarily enables separation of data and functionality. Used correctly, both patterns reduce complexity, coupling and cognitive load while increasing testability. Implementation-wise, both patterns make use of polymorphism, but while the decorator pattern only requires a single dispatch, which is for the trait of the action, the visitor pattern requires a double dispatch, a trait for the visitor as well as the visitable. 
So, when should you use the decorator pattern then? If you want to extend or alter already existing functionality without changing the existing code. Or if you want dynamic extensibility in general. Also, if you need to combine behaviors in every single way, like a combinatorial explosion. And if you want to simplify code and reduce test cases. Just imagine testing the all-in-one attack versus the individual decorators. With decorators there are way less test cases required, and the tests are also easier to write and reason about. Some other typical use cases for decorators would be a file reading system, where a basic file reader can be enhanced with decorators to add encryption, compression or buffering. Or a logging system, that decorates a basic logger to add features like formatting, timestamping or saving logs to a file. A payment gateway system, where a base payment handler is decorated with additional responsibilities like fraud detection, transaction auditing or user notifications. Also, the decorator pattern can be used for any kind of HTTP middleware, i.e. parsing cookies, handling authentication or compressing responses. And a rather new area of application would be decorating a base data processor in a machine learning pipeline with steps like scaling data, handling missing values, or generating synthetic features. Now we're done with decorators. I hope that you could develop a firm grasp on the fundamentals behind the decorator pattern, as well as its use cases. I always try to distill those topics down until they fit into a compact video, while not leaving out important details. And my goal is to make you a better engineer by going deeper into those topics than what you would typically see on other channels. I do this because I strongly believe that learning the fundamentals will trigger a compounding effect on your knowledge as a software developer, leading to sustained growth and ultimately a strong confidence in your skills. And if you found some value in today's lesson, consider subscribing and leave a like. I'll see you in the next one with Green Tea Coding.